Good morning. Welcome to Good Vibes. Um, we are continuing with our special coverage of the COVID-19 virus. And so I'm very excited to welcome Kimberly Green from the Diakonos Group. Hi, Kimberly. Great job on the name. Thank you. I tried so hard. <laughs> <laughs> How are you today? I'm good. How are you? I'm great. Um, would you tell us a little bit about your company so people know who you are? Uh, the Diakonos Group has been around um, for uh, 20 years, and we um, specialize in elder care, but we also have group homes for adults with intellectual disabilities, independent, and assisted living, um, along with our skilled nursing and long-term care. Okay, so you kind of run the gamut yes. of the different long-term care facilities. Okay, and you said you had how many locations? We have 20 facilities across the state of Oklahoma. That's amazing. So I'm assuming because you're in this industry and you have so many that you are actively engaged in preventative measures toward COVID-19? Absolutely. And we were actually very assertive and proactive um, prior to prior to there even being very many cases in the United States. So once we had we had heard of a death in Washington State in a nursing facility, mm -hmm. we jumped into play um, this last Monday and uh, put some pretty extreme measures in place in some of our buildings. Would you well, care to elaborate on what some of those are just so our audience can have an idea? Uh, absolutely. So um, we started with, and of course that's changed as cases have increased, but we started with um, visiting hours. We set visiting hours in our buildings. So we have two different times uh, where we have visiting hours in the morning and we have visiting hours in the evening, which as you know, is pretty rare in long-term care. You know, you mm -hmm. only do that in a crisis situation. Um, so we implemented visiting hours because we put sanitization stations um, at every single building, at every entrance. And what that included was um, Lysol for shoes, sanitizer for hands, Lysol for your purses and your bags. Um, and then as the week progressed, we also have temperature stations where wow. um, every visitor has to take their temperature and every staff member has to take their temperature twice a day and log mm -hmm. it for us um, so that we can uh, chart that and see if we have any risk going into our facilities for our elders. We also do not allow vendors in our building any longer, um, except for food. We have to have people that understand that if you've traveled out of state, um, then you can't come into our building, or if you've flown on an airplane, you can't come into our building. And the other vendors um, drop everything outside the door and we bring it in. Wow, okay. So if someone presents, whether it be a vendor, a staff person, or an individual that's wanting to visit, and they present with a fever, do you, turn them around and send them home? Absolutely, that actually happened on Saturday. And um, we implemented temperature checks on Friday after a Tulsa COVID, uh, a Tulsa resident tested positive for COVID. Right. Um, and so we then rolled out our next step, which was temperature logs. On Saturday morning, we had a housekeeper come to work and at the door and we've had the station set outside the front door so that somebody can't actually get in the building. Set. Okay. Um, and she had a 101 degree fever. And we and she says, I don't feel sick. I'm like, yeah, we said, you got to turn around. You can't come in and you have to be fever free without medications for 48 hours. Okay. So, um, so that worked. So that worked very well. Oh, very good. Have you had any pushback from residents or families of residents? I mean, is everybody pretty happy with the protocol you've put in place? We actually braced. We thought that the, the negative feedback would be really big and that we would have a battle on our hands. And we actually only had one negative uh, Facebook uh, comment. And mm -hmm. after I talked with the woman, um, she did not have um, her facts correct. Oh. And I gave her the CDC and the WHO links mm -hmm. so that she could educate herself. And she came back and apologized and erased her comment but all social nice. media linkedin and um, we've um had tons of families everybody is absolutely ecstatic that we are being this proactive with our most vulnerable that's wonderful do you i, I don't want to ask you a clinical question but if this disease does progress the way it looks like it might what would be other measures you might be taking in the future 
if you feel it's necessary? We would continue the temperature logs for staff. However, we would shut down all visitation um, hours. Um, there's always exceptions to that if someone is in an active dying process sure. and, and those kinds of things. We heavily screen and let family members be at bedside and those mm -hmm. kinds of things. We want to do what's best for our residents and patients and clients and, and not punish them. Um, but yeah, we would have to stop um, visitation it, and then we would just continue to monitor our staff like we are and anybody that shows any signs or symptoms, even without a fever. Mm -hmm. if, they, if they are coughing, if they're sneezing, and here we are in Oklahoma where spring is rampant. Yes, and, and allergies are, are <laughs> right? already but, hitting. But, but they can't even tell us if you have to have a fever in order to be contagious. You know, there's so much we don't know right now. And so um, we, we have to be as, as, I like the word assertive other than aggressive, but mm -hmm. um, it's gotten to the point where I think we have to be aggressive if we're going to protect our elders. Yes, absolutely. We are all on the same page with that, I think, you know, in our, our viewership, because most of our viewership are CNAs themselves. And, you know, I'm concerned about the risk to them. And I know as caregivers, mm -hmm. you know, we're trained to do the best infection control and, and uh, take care of ourselves so we don't get sick. But I worry about the workers and who's going to take mm -hmm. care of the sick if they get sick. So, mm -hmm. you know, how do we how do we address that? Uh, that is, I think, the biggest concern. I mean, of course, we don't want we don't want COVID, of course, or any flu or virus you right. know, to go rampant through our buildings. We don't want any of that. And if you're using those universal precautions and not coming to work sick and those kinds of things, then you don't have to worry about any of that. You know, so some people say, well, the flu and some people are saying COVID, you know, are, are a bigger risk. But any virus, if you take those precautions, you're going to avoid that. However, we get our staff where they can't come into work and we have a disaster. Mm -hmm. um, I wish I had magic fairy dust to, <laughs> to, to make that not happen because, as you know, it's just so crucial out there right now anyway. Um, the only thing that, that we have plans is everybody is called to the floor. Um, you know, support staff, which is what we call our corporate staff. And we all have to report to work on any facility that um, is having any staffing issues. And we, we all do everything we can. But that's one of my biggest concerns too. What happens when there's not enough medical personnel to care for uh -huh. those that need it? Mm -hmm. Would you have? But my, but my, I'm sorry to interrupt. But my biggest thing is for for the healthy people to understand that they can still carry this to the to our door. Mm -hmm. You know, and you and I were talking about people thinking it's no big deal. Well, it's a lot of staff education. It's a lot of family education because if their families are traveling, then if they don't meet certain criteria, they can't come back to work either even oh. if it's just their family traveling, because that's how this is being passed around the world is through people traveling. Right. And so, um, and, and so we have to, re we have to remind everybody that even though it, that it's COVID is not necessarily killing the healthy people, right. it's the healthy people that are bringing it to the doorstep of our most vulnerable. They're mm -hmm. the ones bringing it to us. It doesn't get in in any other way. So everybody right. has to take this seriously. Right. And, and, we do have historical data to prove that with the flu, because it mm -hmm. very typic, very typically the same thing with the flu. The younger people, not children, but our age, get the flu and then accidentally pass it on to somebody in the either young or the older group, and that can be deadly to them. So mm -hmm. even though we don't have that data with COVID, we do have that with the flu, and we can pretty much assume it's going to take the same mm -hmm. path. So okay, right. the, the, the most vulnerable didn't go and travel, <laughs> at least not all of them, not all of them. I know, they're, they're percent, but, I know but Gary's getting ready to go. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to be testing him when he comes back. <laughs> yeah, my parents are in, in long-term care. They would love to be going yeah. <laughs> to Italy yeah. or something, you know. Mm -hmm. So I have one last question for you. What advice would you have for the CNAs that are working in a facility that maybe are not being as proactive as you are? Um, they're kind of in a vulnerable position because they don't really have the ability to do all the things that they would like to see. And sometimes there aren't receptive people to hear, you know, so would you recommend they just talk to their bosses about how they're concerned? 
Yes, I mean, I think communication is key, but as you and I were talking about, when someone doesn't necessarily want to hear it or believe what you're saying, that can be a really difficult situation, especially if you're a direct care staff member. Yeah. Um, so what I would do is, of course, educate yourself as, as much as you can, protect yourself. Mm -hmm. um, you need to use all of the universal precautions. You need to know that you have PP protective, personal protective equipment available. If something gets into your building, know what the signs and symptoms are and reach out to other people um, that you know and can trust that may be able to have some of those hard conversations with those above you if you have tried yourself and it has not gotten anywhere. Mm -hmm. So um, the only way for this to continue um, to, to get better is for more and more education and more and more hard conversations. Mm -hmm. And so if you've tried that hard conversation and it didn't go anywhere, don't be afraid to reach out to NACA. Yep. You know, don't be afraid to reach out to other people you may, may you may have met at convention, speakers, mm -hmm. those kinds of things that may be able to say, hey, here's some links, or I'm willing to talk to them um, to, to just help be more proactive. You know, just try everything that you can, but protect yourself. That's very good advice. Well, I know you are in great demand. You're waiting to do another interview after me. So I'm not going to take up any more of your time, but I so appreciate you joining us today. Well, thank you and stay safe. Thank you. You too. Bye -bye. All right, everybody. I am so excited that Kimberly could join us and, and she had lots of good things to say. If you have concerns, Ashley said, reach out to NACA, reach out to somebody you trust, and we will certainly try to help you. But as we hear a sneeze in the background. <laughs> but we, we're glad to help you in any way we can. So feel free to do that. And until I see you next time, peace out.